one's a one, that's a one. If this is a one, that's a one. If both of them are one, that's a one. Either or. Uh, the app I think I can kind of ignore because it really doesn't add anything to the discussion. But let me try a different one. This is really called an inclusive or. Meaning either or both. Meaning inclusive, including all possible conditions for the OR logic. This one, I'm going to symbolize by putting an extra line on the input, is called an exclusive OR. And I'm bringing out this whole array of stuff because this is material that's at least on the extra test. I think some of it might be on the general test. Exclusive OR says you can have a one here and a one here. I should say you can have a 1 here and a 0 here and meet the condition for 1. You can have the opposite, 1 here and 0 there, meet the condition for 1. If both of them are 0, the output will be 0. But if both of them are 1, the output will also be 0. In other words, either but not both. That's exclusively either and not inclusively both. Let's draw what's called a truth table. Make some sense out of this. And that's about as far as I really need to take it. I'm going to try to figure out if I want to. Yeah, I'm going to take it a little bit further, but not too much. Just enough so you can pass the test, okay? Um, truth table. That's what they call these things. Not because of the voices live, but you want to know what kind of an output you're going to get depending on the input. So we're going to call the input of this guy A and B, and the output C, A, B, and C, A, B, and C. This only has an A. The output we'll call C anyway. Uh, and let's map out all the possibilities here. So we're going to start out with a number. This will be A, this will be B. And these, we're just going to count up to uh, three. That's zero, that's one, that's two, and that's three. Why is that three? One times two to the first power, one times two to the zero power. 2 plus 1 is 3. 2 plus nothing is 2. 1 plus nothing is 1. And nothing plus nothing is nothing. Like so, this. Okay. Now the C is going to depend on what it is. Uh, if you were talking about an AND gate, if the inputs are both 0, you're going to get nothing out. If either is not both, you're going to get nothing out. You're going to get a one only of both. That's why it's called that. A and B have to be true. Truth tables because it's what's true. That's another binary possibility. True, false, high, low, on, off, up, down. All right, that's the end. Or, I'm talking about the inclusive one. If both are zero, you get a zero. If either is a one, you get a one. If both are a one, you get a one. But if it's an exclusive or, they, they sometimes it's called an XOR. <coughs> if both are zero, you're going to get a zero. If both are one, you're going to get a zero. Only if 
one of them happens to be a one you get the true output, the plus output, the one output. Uh, the inverter is pretty easy. Uh, there's no A and B. It just go by A. It'll be the it'll be the opposite of whatever the input is. If it's one, it's zero. It's one. And if it's one, it's zero. And the reason you do that is so you can. Whoops. You can do certain kinds of logical calculations. What kind of logical calculations can I do with this junk here? Um, I can build a computer. I can do almost anything in the way of control circuit. How do we do that? Um, I'll show you a couple of possibilities. Let's start with the most basic thing in logic circuits. You'll hear this word spoken more during political campaigns than you will during electronics, but the word is flip-flop. Oh, the politician flip-flops. He said A today, since it says B tomorrow. He stole that term from us, guys. Flip-flop is a bistable match. Which you can just think of as a switch. Yeah, and you can even think of it as a memory circuit. You will see why. Let's, let's design one. To do that, I'm going to add something here. I'm going to take a little bit of this and I'm going to add it to one of these guys. Oh, I, you know, before I erase this, <laughs> I should have shown you NOR uh, and NAND, but all you have to do is take this guy, and understand it to be the same as this guy, followed by one of these guys. So the truth table would normally be 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1. Normally the truth table for the output of C would have been, you have to have both these guys lit in order to get a one output. If you happen to have an inverter here, and now you've got an AND, negative AND, it would be exactly the opposite, you know, just like the inverter does. It just takes the one turns it to a zero, or the zero and turns it to a one. That's what I'm going to use here. I'm going to use a NAND gate to create that basic thing called a flip-flop. And this particular basic kind of flip-flop, we call it an RS flip-flop. stands for reset, set, flip-flop, and then we use it in this fashion. We have two of these guys here, and the output of one goes to here, and the output of the other goes to here. Hmm. All right. I have to explain a few more things before I can make sense out of this. What does he do? Well, I'm going to throw in a couple of details that I didn't mention before. <clears throat> if I've got nothing connected to one of these guys, because of the internal circuit, it has what's called a pull-up resistor. It really means internally it's got a resistor connected to 5 volts. It's going to logically look like a 1 if nothing's connected to it. So that's a 1. That's a 1. Okay, we've got a 1 here and a 1 here. And what about what's coming out of the other thing? Well, let's just, let's just pretend. Let's just say for the sake of argument this guy's a zero. Well, he can only be a zero here if this guy was also a one. So you had a one and a one making for a one which got inverted to a zero. You have to start somewhere. Okay, the zero here and the one here produces a condition for a zero here, which gets inverted by this guy into a one. So now you've got a zero coming out of here and a one coming out of here. Whatever this guy is, it's going to be the opposite of this guy. Because if I were to take ground and attach it to this guy, all of a sudden 
this guy that was one becomes a zero. Now we got zero and zero. An AND gate with both input zero will give you a one for an output. This thing will get converted to a zero. Now you got a zero here and a one here, and you have the condition for a zero here, which gets converted to a one. It flips. It flops. If I put an, if I put this ground the zero, which is really a zero. To this guy, he'll flip to this condition. If I put it to this guy, he'll flip to the condition we started with. And it will stay that way until somebody touches it again. Why do we use devices like that? It's a memory circuit. It remembers what the last setting was. It's a storage device, but you know, I, I can think of some practical ideas for it. Here's a switch. In a very, almost like a telegraph key. When this thing closes, um, if you look at it an oscilloscope and you really study what happens here, there's what they call a contact bounce before it closes. And there's actually a very short period of time where instead of one closure, you get multiple closures. These things are two metallic objects and they, there's a certain bounce there. And if you were counting the number of times you push the button, Every time I push the button, it might register 5, 10, or 20 button pushes because of that contact bounce effect. But if instead we had two contacts here, and you had to throw the switch this way or that way, and these guys were the inputs to this system, and this was the ground, then you wouldn't have a contact bounce problem. You flip the switch this way, it solidly goes 1, 0, and if you flip it that way, it solidly goes 0, 1. So this becomes a contact debouncing circuit. That was one of the earliest applications for one of these guys. Hmm. It's good for that. All right, let's do some fancier stuff with it. So they usually cool. use those in alarms. Uh, yeah, <coughs> because a guy's going to push a button and you really want to know, you know, you touch a keypad. You touch the key keypad on your computer. Uh, what would it be like if you touched, you know, you're spelling your name, R-I-C-H, and you get three R's and five I's and seven C's and one D. You know, it would drive you nuts. You could, you'd say, this is useless. I can't work with a machine like this. Every time I push the button, I get seven results. So they put a deep on circuit, logically or uh, by other means. They use a Hall effect switch on a keyboard on a computer, which is really a feature of a certain kind of crystal where when you put a magnet next to it, it switches it on or off. And that, that tends to become bounce free because it, it, it snaps into one condition or the other. But before they used to actually use double throw switches and they got the debouncing effect of that. So, you know, you got a keypad for an alarm, you got to put in your code to de disarm the alarm. You want it to go in accurately. <coughs> so, you need a circuit like this to clean up the contact effects. Well, it's also on vibration sensors, if it's too yeah. sensitive. Um, but, you know, you're dealing with computer circuits now, and they are just going to react to the you know, tiny sliver of voltage change. Um, with TTL devices, you actually have, you know, logical zero and logical one. Okay, so where, where, where do you define each one? Uh, there's this gray area in between, you know. Uh, if it's at zero, it's definitely zero, but it's in five volts. It's definitely one. So I think it depends on the device, but it used to be something like, oh, about one and a half volts here was the transition above which it would tend to be regarded as a one, and you had to go below about four and a half volts to be regarded as, as um, a zero. In other words, you had the transition <coughs> all the way up to four and a half to get it to go be a one, and all the way down to one and a half to, to make the transition state go the opposite direction. And in between is a gray area. It, it wouldn't do anything unless it saw a real change down to the next threshold. So that, that is, that's, that's where you have to be a little accurate in designing a logical circuit to make sure that you don't have a lot of resistance there. You have to have, it's a very small current, so you're not, it's not going to be affected by resistance a lot, but it has to be low enough. Enough copper has to be on the PC board to make sure that you have that threshold for transition. Here's a, here's the thing I'm going to do. 
I'm going to take an Iris flip flop and <coughs> I'm going to connect it to another Iris flip flop. transistor circuit that switches the output of this to this. So this thing will have a, a, an existing condition. When the clock signal goes through, in other words a positive transition, whatever's here will show up here. They put these things in symbolic devices like this where the input is called J and K and the output is Q and Q naught. Uh, they call this a JK flip-flop, and I don't know the history of that name. I know it was able to look that one up. And then you got this thing here that's called a clock. And what happens is, when you get the clock, the input transitions through the output. So it becomes a storage device until you decide that a certain point in time you want to sample, you want to probe what you're input is and store it in your output. There's another feature here. If you took the two inputs and you tied them high you know, or disconnected them so they'd automatically float up to 5 volts, uh, really doesn't matter what the input is, but every time the clock goes through, this thing would flip. And what good is something like that? Here's your clock signal coming in. Here's your JK output going out. Um, it's a frequency divider. Basically, it divides by two. 